Hello, everybody. Uh, Miss Blanchard back here. Um, I am at home on my couch. New day, clean shirt. Okay. Um, hope you all are doing well. Um, okay, so today we're going to pick up and talk um, about the Cold War. Uh, I have a lot of video clips in here from a movie called Bridge of Spies. Um, it's a good movie. It's a Tom Hanks movie, speaking of coronavirus. Um, but uh, it goes into this whole like spy ring. It can get a little long and complicated. Um, if you do like movies, especially like Cold War intrigue kind of movies, uh, it is a good, good one. Um, you guys have a lot of uh, free time on your hands, uh, so maybe something to do uh, one of these nights. Um, I think it's on Amazon Prime. I know I bought it a few years ago, but I think um, today when I logged in, it did say it's on Amazon Prime. So um, uh, if not, ask your parents before buying it or find a bootleg copy on the internet. I did not just say that. Okay. So here is what we're doing today. Um, uh, these two topics, 8.2 and 8.7. Um, really for 8.2, um, I have here, it's on from page five uh, on the Cold War. Explain the continuities and changes in Cold War politics. That should not be capitalized. Uh, from 1945 to 1980. So in the 50s, you know, what's going on with the Cold War? You guys already did a lot of work. Um, with uh, some of these key concepts with what's going on in the Middle East, in Asia, specifically Vietnam, um, and Latin America. Um, and today we're going to talk about like the general um, overall Cold War. Um, and so our key concept here is the Cold War fluctuated between periods of direct, like Korean War, Vietnam War, and indirect military confrontations and periods of mutual coexistence. And much of the 1950s is that mutual coexistence, a term will eventually under Nixon come to describe as detente. Um, and uh, I mean, we're involved in Vietnam, but we really haven't. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I am checking a text message. We're involved in Vietnam, but like what most Americans think was the Vietnam War has not started yet. So it's more indirect, um, not even military confrontation. It's that mutual coexistence. Um, so that's on page five and page, page seven. You might just want to make a quick notation of this. I think most of the notes you would want to write, uh, write would be on page, actually, um, really page 21 in your packet. Um, has a couple different political cartoon pictures on a political cartoon there. Uh, from topic 8.7, America is a world power. Explain the various military and diplomatic responses to international developments over time. Um, and what we'll get to perhaps in a second video, Americans debated the merits of a large nuclear arsenal, the military industrial complex, and the appropriate power of the executive branch in conducting foreign and military power. You may have already started to think about that, the appropriate power of the executive branch, because really everything you guys read about for the foreign policy discussion last week was the executive branch conducting foreign policy through the CIA. It's not um through the legislative branch it's not the, the shared power like we talked with with for spanish american war world war one world war ii the president never goes to congress and gets their authorization for force um so it is an issue uh, and then today we're gonna um maybe in a second video get to talk about um here on page 21 um this paragraph from eisenhower's farewell address um, about the military industrial complex. That really kind of joins a lot of what you watched in the previous videos with what we're gonna do in these next one or two videos. Sorry, I'll stop playing with my hair. Um, okay, so let's go on. There we go. Um, I, Ike Eisenhower, uh, unusually well prepared to be a Cold War president because he had been a, um, a, our highest ranking general during a war. Um, his goals are to take a strong stance against communism by use of massive retaliation with nuclear weapons and covert CIA um, operations, which is what you guys read about, and to reduce defense spending and relax Cold War tensions. Um, after McCarthyism, Eisenhower really does see the toll that uh, the Cold War and the Red Scare is having on Americans, and he wants to allay those Cold War fears. And you saw that in the previous videos we did um, on the society of the 1950s in that everybody's kind of happy, happy on the outside, but just like our Cold War strategy, a lot of those fears become more um, internal and covert rather than overt. Um, here's a picture of Eisenhower. Um, he has military experience in Europe and Asia. He's very pragmatic, well-organized. He's a good diplomat. He's a good politician. People generally really like him, um, talk to him, can work with him. And he uses um, a Cold War hardliner 
John Foster Dulles to be a Secretary of State. And of course, we um, most likely talked about in class that Dulles's brother, Alan Dulles, is also the head of the CIA. So here you have these two brothers in charge of our foreign policy and our covert policy. So there's no, um, uh, it's no coincidence, right, that our foreign policy and covert policy become one and the same in the 1950s. Um, so Eisenhower wants more bang from his buck for the nuclear weapons. Um, we have nuclear weapons and long range delivery missiles. We'll be talking about a little bit more under Kennedy. Um, we're starting to develop uh, MER, um, not MERVs yet, um, but medium range ballistic missiles and ICBMs. The early, by the end of the decade, we'll start to have ICBMs, which are intercontinental ballistic missiles. And think about what that means, right? Intercontinental, that's how long range they can go is between continents. And so um, Dulles and uh, Eisenhower use a, quote, massive retaliation strategy. And again, think about what that says. It, you're going to retaliate, you're going to respond massively with everything in your nuclear arsenal. So it actually ramps up the Cold War um, by making nuclear war less likely, right? Because I know if I use any kind of nuclear weapon on you, how are you going to respond? Massively. How will I respond then? Massively. And it will ensure um, mutual destruction. So it takes the Cold War and turns it up. And so you see that in a lot of these Cold War fears that um, it's now not just the use of a nuclear weapon, it's the fear of nuclear proliferation. And it offers no real intermediate course of diplomacy. Um, it often means targeting civilian targets rather than military ones, like we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it uses this idea of brinkmanship, push your enemy to the brink of nuclear war, use failed threats, even direct threats of nuclear war if necessary. And this is exactly what Eisenhower does in Korea to end the Korean War, is threatens nuclear war. By then we have the H-bomb, uh, the Russians do not, they do have an atomic bomb by that point, so we can push them to the brink of nuclear war, knowing with confidence that we would um, you know, win that. Oh, and there we go, there's my reminder. So just a quick re uh, refresher, maybe some of you are hearing it for the, the first time, uh, very famously one of the presidential candidates um, in 2016 uh, forgot the three parts of the nuclear triad. Uh, so here we go. Um, it's air. So the Air Force becomes really important um, during the Cold War. It's going to be our preferred um, method of nuclear weapon delivery. And we'll see talk about um, today uh, of spying and espionage. Um, the Air Force had been part of the Army, but during the Cold War, um, it has made its own branch of the armed services because of its importance. Um, so we had air. Now we have water. Uh, and here are some of the ballistic missiles I was um, mentioning earlier. Um, sorry, better. There we go. Water. Um, uh, so nuclear subs. Um, nuclear subs. Some people think they they're nuclear powered. Which I don't believe so. They they have nuclear weapons on board, and so the idea is we can have them in the ocean, Atlantic, Pacific. Um, I, mean, I guess Indian and you know uh, Arctic, but uh, I don't really think we're fighting anybody down there. Um, and have them patrolling in case of warfare. Um, and if there was a, a strike, these would usually be our first strike capability um, from the water. So we had air, water, and here's the Polaris sub that's developed. Um, really, I think it's late 50s and the 60s. Um, it has a range of 1,600 miles. I mean, that, that's a pretty big range. Um, and that's a pretty gnarly looking picture of a, a nuclear warhead coming off of Polaris. Um, and land. Okay, so these are the ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. That I mentioned earlier, and then you're going to have like medium range missiles as well. Um, and this is ICBMs are going to be the issue under Kennedy and the um, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, or ICBMs that are located in uh, Russian ICBMs that are located in Cuba, and then eventually American ICBMs that are um, located in Turkey. Um, so all of this is MAD. It's madness, right? Madness, MAD is an acronym for mutually assured destruction, right? If under this idea of um, massive retaliation, if I retaliate against you massively with everything I have and you retaliate against me massively with everything you have, we, ha we are going to be mutually assured um, to be destroyed, mutually assured destruction. Um, 
And then this goes back to that cartoon we looked at from, uh, I think, the very first day of this unit. Um, okay, so what are the stakes of war? Massive retaliation, mutually assured destruction. Mad. Isn't that an awesome picture? Um, okay, so we can kind of skip over this. Uh, the Taiwanese Straits, I don't know how important it is anymore. Um, Chinese attempted to take over islands near Taiwan, that area in between mainland China. These hand gestures make no sense to you. And Taiwan or the, the Taiwanese Straits, you could look at it on a map, um, or ask Brunetti. Um, so those are known as the Taiwanese Straits. There's a lot of small islands in there, and China tries to take them over. So um, at, uh, by 54, I don't believe the Chinese have a bomb at all yet. If anything, they have an A-bomb, but I don't think so. So Eisenhower goes in and uses massive retaliation. It's easy to, or, or yeah, massive retaliation, uses brinkmanship with them. Um, it's easy to threaten it to somebody like China who doesn't have nuclear weapons in their arsenal yet or has smaller nuclear weapons. Um, but when you're, you're taking on somebody like Russia, the Soviet Union, um, this pressure is going to uh, lead to a lot of internal pressures and this fear of constantly living in um, a age of potential nuclear holocaust uh, and this, um, yeah, um, we don't have to go too much into it. Um, this is really, I, I debated taking this out, um, the Egyptian crisis. I will mention it because of what it leads into and that's important. Um, this is really a British issue. Uh, in 1956, Egyptian leader Nasser uh, nationalized the Suez Canal, very similar to some of the other nationalization movements we talked about in this period. You guys read about Iran, uh, Cuba, Guatemala. Um, the, the Suez Canal had been built by a French and British company. Uh, fun fact on the Housewives of New York, the Countess, um, her husband, that's how they became a count uh, because their, their family built the Suez Canal. Um, it's joint owned um, British and French. And Nassar nationalizes it. Basically, he says it's no longer your property. Uh, it belongs to the people of um, Egypt. Um, and, we, you know, if we were in class, we could, you know, talk about this and debate it a little bit more. Um, you know, what that means that they were colonized and had, you know, this resource taken away from them. And yes, they're taking back a, a foreign country's um, uh, capital and uh, resources there, but it's also like, an attempt of, of, of this uh, decolonization and taking back uh, the wealth that has been uh, extracted by colonizing countries. Um, so anyway, France and, and um, England uh, invade Egypt to take back the canal by force. Um, and the USSR steps in to kind of speak up for Egypt, hoping that this leftward movement might lead them further to the left to um, support socialism, maybe eventually communism. Um, Eisenhower doesn't want the USSR to attack, um, so he threatens Russia. So we don't send in our army, we threaten Russia with nuclear war, again, using this brinkmanship. Um, France, England, the USSR eventually all step off. Nobody wants nuclear war. Nobody, um, you know, this brinkmanship is uh, a successful strategy. And the United States really becomes the leader in the Middle East over this Egyptian crisis, that, or the Suez crisis, that really has nothing to do with the United States. Um, okay, so we're going to skip over the quote. And so what does this lead to? It leads to something called the Eisenhower Doctrine, right? So we've had the Monroe Doctrine, the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, so the, uh, um, we, don't, we had the Truman Doctrine. This is the Eisenhower Doctrine. Uh, we'll talk about Nixon Doctrine and hopefully a Reagan and a Bush Doctrine. Um, so the Eisenhower Doctrine recommended the U.S. Armed Force to protect the Middle East from communist aggression. So very similar to the Truman Doctrine, except specifically targeted on the Middle East. So if you ever wonder how we get involved in the Middle East, um, you know, you turn on the news today and once they're done with coronavirus coverage, they're probably going to talk about the Middle East at some point. Um, if you watch it, you know, over the next few days or weeks, at some point, the Middle East will come up. It, it's this time period, you know, and this is our cover fire for Iran. The oil in the Middle East um, is attracting us um, there. I should have a map up here. If we were in class, I'd probably pull it down there. Just geographic um, uh, situation means that they're a gateway into Asia. They're a gateway into Africa. 
and we doubled down there to create like a fire stop of communism. So it, it, communism, do, communism doesn't spread through the Middle East. And again, this kind of goes back to that theme that Middle Eastern countries were colonized. This is all part of the decolonization movement. Um, we intervene again in Lebanon. Um, if you open up their presentation, I think I linked it to the homework document. I have like a like two bullet points on it, um, but we're just gonna move on. Okay. Um, yeah, so like the Monroe Doctrine in Latin America, like the Roosevelt Corollary using police force in Latin America, uh, the United States now emerged as a world power in a new part of the world, and that's going to be in the Middle East. Um, oh, I guess I didn't take it off. Okay, so here are the covert actions, um, you know, and I hope that that was one of the takeaways from the activity we did with the uh, jigsawing all the different um, uh, decolonization countries where we had um, action in the 1950s is that this is covert. This is not a Korean War. This is not a UN battle plan. It's not the Vietnam War where it's showing up on people's nightly news. All of these things are using the CIA and covert actions. And that is one of Eisenhower and the Dulles' strategies is to no longer be overt about Cold War actions, but be covert. Okay, so this is some stuff I used to do. Um, we will take time and watch this video. We're going to be watching several videos. Uh, so here we go. Every one of us must remember to do the same thing. That's what this film is all about. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film produced in cooperation with the Federal Civil Defense Administration and in consultation oh, with the Safety Commission of the National Education yeah. Association. Bert the produced by Archer Productions Incorporated. Hey, Bert, come on out and meet all these nice people, please. All right. We really can't blame you. You see, Bert is a very, very careful fellow. When there's danger, this is the way he keeps from being hurt. Sometimes it even saves his life. That's why these children are practicing to duck and cover, just as you do in your school. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must get ready for it, just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time. Fire is a danger. It can burn whole buildings if someone is careless. But we are ready for fire. We have a fine fire department to put out the fire. And you have fire drills in your school so you know what to do. Automobiles can be dangerous too. They sometimes cause bad accidents, but we are ready. We have safety rules that car drivers and people who are walking must obey. Now, we must be ready for a new danger, the atomic bomb. First, you have to know what happens when an atomic bomb explodes. You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. It looks something like this. There is a bright flash, brighter than the sun, brighter than anything you've ever seen. If you are not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. It could knock you down hard or throw you against a tree or a wall. It is such a big explosion it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. Okay, you know how be... bad sunburn can feel. Okay, the I'll atomic I bomb said, flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn, especially oh, where you're not covered. I'm a no, you and I don't have shells. Like Bert, 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 Bert. I'm going to be on the, on the TV. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck, your face. Duck and cover underneath a table or desk or anything else close by. In Betty's school, they are talking about the atomic bomb, too. Betty is asking her teacher, how can we tell when the atomic bomb may explode? And her teacher is explaining that there are two kinds of attack. 
with warning and without any warning. We think that most of the time we will be warned before the bomb explodes. So there will be time for us to get into our homes, schools, or some other safe place. Our civil defense workers and our men in uniform will do everything they can to warn us before enemy planes can bring a bomb near us. You may be in your schoolyard playing when the signal comes. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Always remember, a flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. You might be out playing at home when the warning comes. Then be sure to get into the house fast where your parents have fixed a safe place for you to go. If you are not close to home when you hear the warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go, or ask an older person to help you. You know the places marked with the S sign? There are safe places to go when you hear the alarm. If there is a warning, you will hear it before the bomb explodes. But sometimes, and this is very, very important, Sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Be like Bert. When there is a flash, duck and cover and do it fast. Here are some older boys. Okay, we're going to move on here for a second. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, you can look it up readily on YouTube. Um, but I went to, again, this reinforcing the idea of everything's becoming covert. Look how they're dealing with the issue of nuclear war, like this cute little song, duck and cover with cartoons. Um, here is a um, advertisement to buy a bomb shelter. Um, and, you know, uh, many of us are sheltering in place, more or less, oops, during our, our uh, these past few days. Um you know, like you see like almost like a cartoon like family. You have sanitation, a got your own Geiger counter, water food ventilation. You know, it's very um very nineteen fifties and that's very like happy and friendly and it's it's friendly nuclear proliferation and warfare. So, you know, people have very deep seated fears of nuclear destruction, but everything's kind of getting glossed over and um almost like an infantilization during the 1950s of the American public. Okay, um, just really quickly about the space race because you should have read about it. Um, hey, Charlotte, can you go get your beach ball for mommy? Come on. Oh, is it? I think it's deflated. Okay. Um, anyway, if you think about the size of a beach ball, Susie, that... Yeah. Why did you ask to? Well, because I usually take it into school to show my students um, because it's like a satellite from space. And the Russians launched it into space, and it went around the Earth three times. And it would go, ping! Ping! Real? Yeah, it was real. It was like a big beach ball in space. And if you had a, um amateur radio, like ham radio, which was very popular in the 50s, you could track it going through the sky um, at certain parts, because it is metal, um, at sunset and sunrise. Excuse me? Yeah, I'm going to watch Lumpy. I know you do. We're going to watch Lumpy in like three minutes. Can you be patient for Mommy? No. No? Okay. And Daddy to put it on. Well, I'll put it on for you. Daddy is... Hold on one second. Um, uh, it crosses four times over the United States. It really goes around the Earth about three and a half times. And then um, this is your physics, right? It's, a, it's a basically a ballistic um, a projectile. Uh, eventually, it starts to slow down from the Earth's atmosphere because of the friction, and it eventually just comes back to Earth and, and lands, I think, in the ocean. Um, if you had a ham radio, you could track it. Um, oh, I was saying at certain points uh, at sunrise and sunset, just like a weather balloon, you could see the sun reflecting off the metal, so you could actually see it in the sky. People would turn out um, to watch it like pass over. Um, however, it strikes fear into the hearts of Americans, because if they could put, like, a, basically a metal like basketball into space that could come over the United States not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. What if they then put, could put a nuclear weapon into that? What if they could put an explosive into that? Um, so, and I'm sorry it's getting cut off here, in 1958 the National um, Defense of Education Act is passed 
to ramp up our um, universities and schools, the College Board um, and AP program is actually an effect of that. We feel we are falling behind in the space race um, and that the best way to prepare us for um, the space race and for this general Cold War is going to be a Cold War of science. And so we have to provide college level instruction to high school students to get them to be more advanced. So by the time they get to college, they could be doing postgraduate work and more research and development than in their postgraduate careers. So I love this cartoon because what is the effect of Sputnik on the US? It kind of like wakes us up. Here Uncle Sam is asleep in a bed of complacency and we are awake at last, right? This um, Sputnik outside of our window is beeping, wakes us up from this complacency that we have been living. So the space race intensifies uh, between the United States and USSR. Uh, leads, to, leads to fears that the USR, USSR was leading the race to create uh, ICBMs. Inter One second, honey. Intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so it speeds up our plans to build... I I no, not Charlotte, mommy. Mm -hmm. I said daddy. I know, but daddy's going to tell you the same thing mommy's telling you. Um, it's going to speed up our plans to build ICBMs and IRBMs, interrange ballistic missiles I mentioned earlier. Um, he puts he, uh, Khrushchev, the premier, uh, Stalin had died in 53. Khrushchev emerges as a leader around 1955. Um, Khrushchev uses Sputnik to put U.S., the United States, on the defensive. Um, he goes to the U.N. and... Uh, he actually takes off his shoes and slams it on the table and says, we will bury you. Your children will live under communism. Your grandchildren will live under communism. And we kind of wake up from this like 1950s complacency at the end of the decade. Um, it's, the, you know, this fear that America is growing soft. So, yes, you have the creation of the National Defense of Education Act. You also have the creation of NASA, NASA in 1958. Um which is going to become more active in the 60s, especially with Kennedy's promise uh, in 1960 that we will put a man on the moon in the decade. Um, the National Defense of Education Act also gives um, defense loans to universities, grants um, to universities, and low interest student loans to students to get um, more uh, in intelligent students that may not have the means to attend university uh, to university. And so you think about the effects of the GI Bill and now the National Defense of Education Act, you're getting more um, middle class, even working class kids into college, all going to, you know, create better educated generations of Americans. And so you see a lot of science in the decade. Um, the first mainframe Daddy. computer, several of you are working Daddy. on. Ignore her. Um, the hydrogen bomb test. Um, well, actually, Rosemary... Um, Rosemary uh, Franklin uh, discovers the DNA structure, um, but then Watson and Crick steal it from her. Uh, Jonas Salk in 1954 uh, invents the vaccine for polio. Um, you know, as some of you ask your parents or grandparents if they were alive. Um, back then, the vaccines were like these big things, and they had kids line up in school. There was a polio academic, uh, ep epidemic, huh, it's kind of uh, interesting uh, relation to today. And there was a fear that America would lose an entire generation of school children to polio. So they were lining kids up in school and they had almost like this gun with different cartridges in it. And the cartridges were the vaccine and the kids would line up. I don't even think they had to roll up their sleeves. The needle was big enough. And the, you know, the school nurse would just shoot them all in the arm with their polio vaccine. In 1957, and we'll come back to this, um, begins the, the nuclear power plants in the United States. Um, with the first commercial U.S. nuclear power plant. A lot of Americans think this is the, the wave of the future, and a lot will be built throughout the 60s and 70s uh, until we have the meltdown at Three Mile Island really makes us um, double think our nuclear strategy. Um, NASA's created, and then the Mercury missions up with the man, first man on the moon. Here's that um, IBM. Hello, sweetie. I got some more. Oh, good. Um, IBM mainframe computer. We're not going to have any more. Did we run out? The first coronavirus victim. Mm -hmm. Charlotte has no more vanilla wafers. Yes, baby. I am almost done. I'm almost done, I promise. Okay. Um, here's the first IBM mainframe computer. All of this is one computer. You would have to feed little cards, and they were called shits, and you would click, 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 click. 
Why is there a picture of you? Uh, because it's recording, Mommy. There's a picture of you, too. See, there you are. I'm giving your consent to have you filmed. Why? Yeah. Um, and you would um, use binary code to program these chit cards. Chit, C-H-I-T. Watch your spelling, kids. And you'd feed them into the machine and go, do, 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 and spit out the answer. Um, it does about the same amount of work as your graphing calculators you guys use in school today uh, um, can do. Um, okay, Man on the Moon, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to watch this um, uh, preview of the blob, um, but just know that uh, science fiction becomes a genre in which um, aliens, blobs, pod people um, and and body snatchers all become a not so subtle metaphor sometime for communism. The aliens become a metaphor for communist and communist invasion. Okay, we're going to pick up with U2 Crisis in the next video. Lots of video clips uh, from Bridge of Spies, but I have to go play the Winnie the Pooh movie uh, for a toddler. So have a good night.